we're about to talk about planning. Planning is, yeah, totally awesome, like the chimp guy showed. Um, it's very cool. Um, and in general, planning is about, now this is going to sound kind of trite, planning is generally about actions. Um, and actions are things that change the world. So the world is a certain way. We take an action, the world changes. So there's been a lot, and I'm, this is a big understatement, the wor there's been a lot of work on how to describe actions in logic. And they're like philosophers who study this and get really into it. Plus there are people like me who like build planning systems to make actual machines do stuff on time. Um, two of the most popular, there, there are three popular ways of representing action. And we're going to talk about the first two in one slide each, and then the third one we're going to spend like a week and a half on. Um, so the first one is the event calculus. I told you John McCarthy invented this word thingification, and everyone thought he wasn't serious enough, so they call it now reification. So in the event calculus, events are reified. They become things in the logic. And this is an awesome logic. And if you ever want to go do natural language processing and machine understanding of written text, you will want to learn about Davidsonian semantics, which is just basically the event calculus. Um, it's where we have events. So here's an event, event 23. It is a member of the class of flyings. And the agent in event 23, the person who did the event, is John. And event 23 happens during interval 7. So this might be a way of saying John flew. There was a flying event done by John, and this is when it happened. And if we knew that if I-7 was in the past, then we would say John flew, because that was its past, rather than John will fly or John is flying. Um, it's a really cool logic, because now that you've reified this event, you can add more and more things about it. Like you can learn new stuff about that flying that John did, like he did it while wearing you know, pink boxers or something. You know, you can just learn more and more stuff about the flying. I just read Peter Pan the other day. It's a really weird book. Really weird. And flying happens in it quite a bit. Um, sorry? Pink uh, no, uh, uh, white nightgowns. Okay. <laughs> um, and what is this? T, at John Kingsbury, N133 at T1. Uh, terminates, the, the, the event 23 was terminated by John's being at King's, oh, John flew to King's, John flew to N133. And what's the T here? T, 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 I've forgotten what this, what the intended interpretation of that predicate is. Um, well, you give it a stiff name like T. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a pretty bad variable name. It's a predicate name, isn't it? That's what it looks like to me. Um, at, at, yeah. So maybe this is saying that. So the the problem with, the problem with uh, reifying events like this is, um, if you want to talk about things that are true at the end of the flying, now all of a sudden we want to be putting sentences, in as things as well, so that we can state that they're related in some way to that event. So n now in first order logic, you're not allowed to have predicates as terms, right? You guys all wrote a parser. You know what first order logic looks like. The only thing you can have here is a variable, a constant, or a function. <coughs> so holy smokes, what's going on? Have I now, am I going to make that a function? And, and the thing it returns is the thing that is the truth value of at when past John and Kingsbury N133. So it becomes a little hairy, the event calculus does. Um, but there are people who study it and they know what to do and I'm not one of those people. But you should just know that the event calculus exists. It's one way of thinking about time and actions. Um, so It's cool, especially if you're doing natural language processing. In AI, the situation calculus is a lot more popular. And that situation calculus is like the reverse of event calculus. Um, instead of reifying the events, 
we re and having the state of the world be something that you would deduce by talking about when events happened and reasoning about time and that sort of thing. Um, instead, we're going to reify the situation. That's why it's called the situation calculus, because we have situations in the logic, and we reason about situations. So um, S0 will be the initial situation, and go forward is an action, and which is a constant in the logic, and then result is a function, which takes an action and a situation and gives you back a situation. So r the result function is this incredibly complicated function that's very important for situation calculus. And you'd say something like, um, if A is clear in S and B is clear in S, and then uh, then it's true that A is on B in the situation that results from putting A on B in S. Right? This is called blocks world. Like I have a little, I have some blocks. I have B and I take A and we're in S and now I put A on B in S. And now we're in a new situation. We're in S2 and A is on B in that situation. So this is a description of the put-on action. It's describing the action in terms of how it manipulates, uh, what becomes true in the situation, how it manipulates the state of the world. So there are people, especially up in Toronto, who love this situation calculus. And they've actually made a programming language called Golog, not to be confused with Prolog, a uh, language called Prolog for, that's actually built on top of the situation calculus. And they can do some pretty cool stuff with it. Um, so I'm not personally a huge fan of the situation calculus. That's why we study it for exactly one slide. Um, but uh, some people are. So, and it provides a nice contrast with the event calculus. So here, they're like, there are no event. Like the event is kind of lost. Like the event happens inside the result function, like between S and the result of action S. That's where, that's where the event is. And it's kind of hard to talk about the event itself, and we can talk about the action that was done, that's the put on action, um, but it's, it's a little hard to say a lot more. Um, time here is very sequential, it's like one thing happening at a time, we transition from one situation to the next to the next after each result. Any questions about this? Everyone see the contrast to the previous logic? Okay. So these are just more examples of how there are lots of different logics, and you know, you can choose the one that's exactly right for what you want to do. All right, this is the last slide on logic, which has to do with all the problems with logic. Um, why is logic not super awesome for everything? Um, and some people think that some of these problems are big enough that there are reasons why AI as an endeavor is, is inherently doomed to failure. Personally, I, I don't view them in such dire terms, but just so you know. The first one is the problem of defaults. We talked about, and not foreclosure, but, but rather like people have two legs. Well, that's not true. Some people have only one. Some people have zero. Um, if I want, it, it's, I talk, we talked about this in the context of semantic networks where we talked about inheritance and some people used inheritance as a kind of default system where, um, you would just look up the hierarchy for the property that you're interested in until you found something that talked about it, and um, you could have exceptions. You know, when you you could be a member of a class but have special values for some of the class variables. Um, and in that sense, you're overriding the default for your class. Um, people have suggested that as a system, but if you actually try and put together semantics for that logic, it's actually very hard. Um, and so coming up with a good way of doing defaults in logic is a big problem. Um, default logic was very popular in AI in the 90s. And these days, people are very excited about probabilistic approaches, where you say something like, you know, for all x, is person x implies there's like a 99% probability the person has two legs. Something like that. So everything's probabilistic, probably true. Not 100% true, but has some probability of being true. So that's sort of the modern approach to defaults. Another problem with logic is called the ramification problem. Um, and this is, this is a problem I think faced by every student. 
sitting in a class. Like someone tells you something new, and you're like, hmm. But the question is, how long do you sit and ponder that new thing? If you're a theorem prover, as you guys well know after the assignment, you can sit and chew for quite a while. If someone tells you, you want to derive, make every single possible inference with that new fact, you could be tied up for quite a while. Someone tells you something that's really mind shaking, like you might miss dinner. So the question of how much to think when someone tells you something, that's a, that's a pretty open question. Um, the ramification problem, um, choosing how far to go with, with any, any particular line of reasoning. Do you wait until some query comes in and then you think? And that's how your theorem prover for the assignment was organized. But then a system like that is like never going to have an aha moment, right? Where it's just like sitting around and then all of a sudden the light bulb will go off in its head. Like unless a query comes in, it does no thinking whatsoever, which is kind of a waste of time, right? If you've got your CPU sitting there, you might as well be thinking about something. So figuring out how to deal with the ramifications of stuff, what to infer when, that's an interesting problem. I view it as sort of an engineering challenge for any particular system. There might be some trade-off of thinking ahead versus waiting to, to think on demand. Um, like right before midterms, usually a good time to do a lot of thinking. Because um, after you've done some deductions, like then that, that new information is cached for quick use. Um, this is another problem, uh, the retraction problem. We talked about this in the context of non-monotonic logic. Like if I tell you that Tweety is a bird, then you're like, oh, wow, Tweety is cute and fluffy and flies. And then I tell you Tweety is a penguin, and you're like, oh, no, I didn't mean to, Tweety doesn't fly. No, I retract that. That thing that I deduced before is now false. It's kind of like the question of defaults. Like how do you handle a default um, when, when you learn something new that makes something previously true now false? Um, and there are special systems for this that we don't talk about in, the, in this class. But just so you know, there are ways of dealing with this. This is the big kahuna, this last problem. Um, and I think that's the one I asked about on the exam last year. Um, a lot of people think this is, this is the, the downfall of AI right here. Um, making stuff correct. Like, and the classic example of this due to John McCarthy is um, starting your car. You turn the key, the car starts. Well, that's not quite true. You turn the key and if your battery is good, the car will start. Well, that's not quite true either. The battery has to go, and you need apparently gasoline in your tank. Yeah, okay. The starter needs to work. The fuel line needs to not be clogged or frozen. Needs to be the right key. Needs to be the right key. Yeah, well that's, that's obvious. <laughs> oh, yeah, all the little engine management unit things need to work. You know, people don't seem to have this issue. People seem to be able to cope um, with poorly specified preconditions. Like, um, you know, if you go to the, if you need to take the bus somewhere, I don't know much about your life, but let's pretend you take Wildcat Transit somewhere. Uh, if you go to the bus stop, at the right time, the bus will come. Like, people tend to operate under a model of the world that is like that. And then, on demand, if the bus doesn't show up, they start qualifying like, oh, well, maybe the bus only comes if operations are not curtailed, and the drivers are feeling good, and, you know, I don't know, any number of other things. Um, people are generally pretty tolerant to having underspecified models. And we'd like our computers to, to be that way too, but we'd also like the computers to be useful um, and derive true things. So um, making the rules correct, very, very big challenge. John McCarthy's example was always that the car will start if you know, the electrical system and the engine system and the fuel system work and no one has put a potato on your tailpipe. Apparently this is a common prank in Stanford where you, apparently it uh, backs up the exhaust and the engine doesn't. Uh, uh, well one year I had a student that disagreed with me, but, but do you have first-hand experience? No. Okay, but, but, but you do know that this. Done everything you could think of in the space and didn't end up being 
I'm not putting my hand over a tailpipe, <laughs> but, but I, uh, putting a potato on, that's not so hard. Um, yeah, so now you guys have definitely learned something useful out of this class. <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't learned anything useful today. <laughs> my wife uses that card to transport my kids. I actually don't use the car, so don't, don't hurt the car. It's not mine. It's my <laughs> wife's car. Um, yeah, I don't even know. Uh, it's 254 something, but I, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I keep it in a garage most of the time. The MIT thing. Dylan. So defaults would be one way of dealing with the qualification problem. Um, but they're slightly different. I mean, defaults, the, the qualification problem is, is uh, like, what are the preconditions for an action? Like, could you ever specify them? I mean, that's a philosophical conundrum. Like, we claim we know how the world, like, things happen. Like, I let this go, it'll fall. Well, that's only, yeah, true if there isn't a giant fan blowing up from beneath. Like, I saw a picture of somebody once like in a parachute jumpsuit, like being blown around by a giant fan in some room. It's like, it's like practice jumping, like there's some giant fan that actually holds people up. It's that much that powerful, it blows my mind. Um, Frank. Yeah, so you want to design some system that is going to derive the right thing um, and um, deal well with change and um, tolerate, tolerate uh, additional information. We, I mean, that's, this is what we want for all computer science things, right? We want it to be sound. And complete. Uh, and fast, exactly. Exactly. So people are very demanding uh, of, of AI, uh, often more than they are demanding of other people. Probabilistic logic is, is probably the biggest hammer that people are trying to hit this with. So the, again, they'll say things like, you know, if you turn the key and the engine works and the electrical system works, then the car is very likely to start. And that little extra probability is there to account for the potato and all the other different things that might be wrong. Um, Dan. For probabilistic logic, yeah. when it isn't right, does it have any, um, any course of action it can take? Or like, can, does it have options that, OK, it didn't work. Here are possible reasons it didn't work. Or does it just say, it'll probably work, and then go down that path? Uh, both. This is the very last unit of the class. We'll talk about, about probabilistic propositional reasoning. And the kinds of queries you can ask there are extremely general and wonderful. So you can say, like, these are the things I know. What's the probability this statement is true? Um, but you can also say, hey, these are the things I know. This is how things came out. What's the value of all the things that I didn't know? What's the most likely configuration of the world given that this happened? Like, you know, he looked good, he came into work today, and then he dropped dead. Like, what's likely to have been the internal thing that I didn't notice that, you know, made him croak? 